Welcome to 1920s Post-War America, Prohibition and Disillusionment. This is Melinda Cole Klein. The decade of the 1920s is hallmarked with international politics, isolationism as the United States rejected the League of Nations Treaty, and turned its back on the rest of the world. However, it was impossible for this to be maintained for long. By 1920, the U.S. became more involved in international trade and politics. The U.S. was an international leader in finance, business, and commerce. U.S. companies grew in number and built factories overseas. The United States led the world in transportation, time-saving inventions, and motion picture production. After World War I, Britain was the leading nation in disarmament. However, American politicians agreed that having a strong navy would keep the peace while the U.S. enjoyed a dominant position as a world power. The stock market crash ended the sense of hope Americans and Europeans had about their future following World War I. It was a time of hate and intolerance, of flappers and bathtub gin, of constant parties and literary masterpieces, and for some wealth and political power. By the end of the decade, industrial nations of the world shared an economic depression. The 1920s is often remembered as an era of wealth, conservative views, and cultural trends. The ideal America was represented in advertisements and books. The ideal America was white, middle class, hardworking as an individual, educated, urban, and consumer oriented. For those that did not fit into these categories, their opportunities would be channeled in other directions. Results of the fear of domestic communism, known as the Red Scare, targeted foreigners and assumed radicals. The trial of Sacco and Vanzetti is an excellent example of the American fear of domestic anarchists. These two Italian immigrants, self-professed Italian anarchists, were arrested for the Massachusetts murder of a payroll clerk and security guard combined with the theft of over $15,000 taken from a shoe company. The event lasted seven years. This is the trial. Did they commit the crimes? Perhaps. That is not important. What is important is that this trial illustrated the fear by Americans that they were not safe and that the 1920s immigrants had the propensity for serious and violent criminal acts. The arrested Italians were finally found guilty by jurors and executed via electrocution. By the 1920s, it would be Italians that would be listed on the U.S. government's most concerned list of immigrant elements coming into the country. Irish and Italian nationals were believed to be prone to violence. Italian immigrants in the 1920s were credited as the source of bombings and assassinations. In this nationally publicized case, Sacco and Vanzetti did not have previous criminal records, but they were identified by government sources to be radical militants. Both of the accused cried political prejudice. Sacco and Vanzetti admitted they associated with other like-minded anarchists and refused to comply to distance themselves from other known anti-government anarchists. The U.S. Constitution was ratified by states between 1787 and 1790. In the last 200 years, it has seen only 27 amendments. The first ten amendments are remembered as the Bill of Rights from 1791, which protected the people in the nation against injury, undue hardship, and protected personal freedoms. 
Amendment number one, protection with the rights of free assembly, speech, press, and petition, while offering religious freedom by separating the government from religion. Amendments two and three, citizen rights to bear arms while the people could not be required by their government to quarter soldiers in their homes. The following is for amendments four through eight. These are familiar as they were inherited from English common law in which citizens would be protected from illegal searches and seizures. The fifth protects against being prosecuted for the same crime twice. We call this double jeopardy. While you can claim the Fifth Amendment if you do not want to give evidence against yourself or before you lose your liberty or material worth, your fate will be decided in a court of law first. The Sixth offers citizens the right to a speedy trial and to ensure fairness. The criminal will be provided with a lawyer or attorney to represent his or her interests. Amendment 7 ensures the accused trial will be conducted with a jury present. And the Eighth Amendment offers a measure of protection in regards to a judge mandating excessive bail. Amendments 9 and 10 are balancing acts between state and federal powers. Amendment 11. This amendment resulted in the right for states to keep lawsuits within their own state. Thus, citizens are not prosecuted at the federal level by national courts. After Amendment 12 was revised, it changed how vice presidents were chosen. From 1804, a vice presidential candidate would no longer be the presidential runner-up, but a running mate of the presidential nominee. Amendments 13, 14, and 15. These amendments were created during Reconstruction. The 13th ended unfree status. This included slavery and indentured servitude in America, created in 1865. The 14th protected citizen rights against unjust state laws that interfered with citizens' rights protected under the Constitution. This is from 1868. The 15th Amendment defines citizenship and voting. This is from 1870. Amendments 16 and 17 were created in 1913. 16 through 19 were made during the Progressive Era. Amendment 16 empowers the federal government to collect income tax. Amendment 17 made the election of senators by popular consent. The voting public chooses them. Amendments 18 and 19. While the 18th Amendment was repealed in 1933, the last of the progressive amendments stands true. Women's groups in particular argued for prohibition as they stated it was the one feature of the family that led directly to poverty, abuse, and neglect of its members and it would be women that would push for this legislation. The 18th Amendment failed to curb American drinking. This social legislation not only failed, but fostered a black market trade in alcoholic beverages. Consumption of alcohol is a part of the fabric of Western culture. Enforcement began in 1920. Amendment 19 gave American women the right to vote in state and federal elections. And this was a long journey for women. Colonial women, those of wealth, education, and property, expected under the laws established by the new government in the early 19th century to be voters. But this is not what happened. Little change for women after the colonial period. If anything, their lives became more divided from the world of business and university as the government admonished Republican motherhood. This American philosophy advocated women's proper place was in the home, which 
For her, her most important role would be to create a responsible and law-abiding citizenry. Whereas women had seen roles as business owners and entrepreneurs in the colonial period, this feature of women's lives in the United States was vanquished. Only poor women should work outside the home. Respectable middle-class women were supported by their husbands, fathers, or brothers. For women who chose education and a career, society saw their role as incompatible with becoming a wife. Therefore, professional women were expected to remain single and chase. This means no sexual activity. The 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote and was ratified in the summer of 1920. Prohibition of alcohol operated from 1920 until it was repealed in 1933. This constitutional amendment outlawed the manufacture, transportation, and sale of spirits, wine, or beer. This law, which is important to remember, did not make it illegal to drink alcohol. Some religious institutions had permission from the government to use wine in their ceremonies. The brewing of home beer continued, along with the illegal production of moonshine. This legislation drove the sale, manufacture, and transportation of alcoholic beverages underground to the black market. The government's goal was to drive the saloons out of business and reduce poor and working class alcohol consumption. But these attempts did little to change American drinking habits. In fact, thousands more died each year than before prohibition because new forms of alcohol were made with substances that were poisonous, such as formaldehyde, which is an embalming fluid. After 1900, many states enacted alcohol limits. The Friendly Corner Tavern, a common place for centuries steeped in politics and commerce, had by the 19th century devolved into corner bars that offered customers lively music, dark corners, illicit sex, and access to vice. Saloons had followed the frontier and expansion. Ending the sale of alcohol had a major economic impact on family businesses and industry along with factory production, as the production of alcohol was the second leading industry at the time in America. However, women's groups and reformers in general wanted these places closed. Bootlegging, the illegal importation of a controlled product, made some families very wealthy because of the new regulations. Large quantities of alcohol were smuggled in from Canada by mob families and from the Caribbean. The Irish Catholic Kennedy family made their fortune from illegal importation of whiskey from Ireland combined with their logistical skills and successful bribery techniques. Bribery was not limited to the up-and-coming immigrant families from Ireland. Gangsters bribed officers and other officials to ignore illegal activities. In addition, by its nature, prohibition created entrepreneurial opportunities for organized crime to take over the importation, manufacture, and distribution of alcoholic beverages. Al Capone, also known as Scarface, one of the most infamous bootleggers of them all, built his criminal empire largely on profits from illegal alcohol. He made most of his money from the distribution of beer to small sellers, unlike his myth and larger-than-life image leads us to believe. While Capone created an infrastructure that was illegal, his typical customers were rich and poor. Also, Capone accumulated vast amounts of money from illegal prostitution, combined with his logistical expertise in procuring, transporting, and selling alcohol. 
Some estimates claim Capone, between 1925 and 1930, was grossing about $100 million a year. Today in America, economic success depends on your ability to become skilled or educated in a field of study and to apply yourself to an economic endeavor. In the recent past, economic success depended on three key features. These were access to and the pursuit of higher education, what gender you were, and your ethnic background. Until the 1960s, most Americans did not consider poor immigrants and blacks contributors to the national economy. Middle class generalizations and attitudes targeting the poor and unemployed were many. Sociologists, scientists, newspaper commentary, and politicians offered a variety of simple explanations why certain ethnic groups lived a seamless, endless cycle of hopelessness. Commentators and business owners argued the type of work certain ethnic groups should be limited to. Commonly held notions of diminished mental capacities, this would include blacks, Eastern Europeans, Poles, and Russians, led middle class Americans to ignore their pleas for equality and recognition as citizens. Such ethnic groups were targeted as a source of contagion, diseases like typhoid and tuberculosis that spread out of inner city slums into middle class neighborhoods. While poverty and urban crowding increased, the view of the poor and hungry stagnated. Some writers evaluated ethnic lives as though they were an alien species. Some illustrated their way of life as unique by ethnic group. But in all, in England and America, the plight of the poor seemed to be a problem inherent due to primary elements of drunkenness, lack of bodily cleanliness and moral living, and resisting full-time skilled employment. All the while, Americans feared the most from socialists anarchists and the new fascist regimes. These new political immigrants embraced violence as a part of their strive for change. Scientists over the last few hundred years have studied variations in human development in the fields of anthropology, phrenology, and craniometry to determine differences primarily of brain and nervous system development and human intelligence. Advocates of the separate races argument justified, at least until the 1950s, a segregated America. To justify racial segregation and to stymie demands by minorities for equality, the scientific community actively sought to show Asians, Blacks, Eastern Europeans, and the Irish were less evolved as humans. Thus, the proper rulers should be the Anglo-Americans, primarily those from British ancestry. While the ancient Greeks studied human brain size, comparing that of the Greeks with the Negro, this science took on new meanings as slavery was coming to an end in the 19th century as a mode of labor. By the turn of the century, scientists had convinced governments their black colonial citizens were best suited as military men because their nervous systems were less evolved. 18th century experiments on blacks drew conclusions that stood until the 20th century. Blacks lacked emotion, decision-making skills, and felt less pain. From the 1830s in America, the business sector and most Americans limited minorities access to jobs. This left the worst jobs in their minds fit for social inferiors such as English immigrants, Asians, and blacks. 
Could scientists prove scientifically non-Anglo-Americans were less evolved and should remain second-class citizens? The scientific community tried hard to prove this. In the end, they justified separating Americans until the 1940s. After the war, society began to shift. Decades later, and after more study regarding differences between humans, the scientific community in the end could not justify racial uniqueness, except for differences in skin color. With the circulation of scientific and political ideas, this would include Freud, socialism, and Bolshevism, many Americans feared for their children and the effects these influences would have on the health and prosperity of the nation. The Scopes trial of 1925, otherwise known in newspapers as the Monkey Trial, pitted lawyers William Jennings Bryan for the prosecution defending the Butler Act and Clarence Darrow representing the teacher John T. Scopes. This Tennessee court case, in a political move, arrested a high school teacher for giving a lecture on biology. The Butler Act forbid the teaching in any public school, and public schools are state funded, quote, any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Christian Bible, and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals, end of quote. This is often interpreted as meaning that the law forbade the teaching of any aspect of the theory of evolution according to Charles Darwin. In the 1920s, Americans were exposed to a range of secular and commercial messages from radio, film, and newspapers. In novels, stories emphasize pleasure, spending money, and sex. Middle-class traditionalists saw the lack of thrift and work ethics as a corruption of the American character. Secular values conflicted with ideals of spending your money wisely, hard work, going to church, and creating a good home life for your family. Fundamentalism in the 1920s encouraged church-going Americans not to buy into the commercial, capitalist, and advertised dream of an imagined America popularized in magazines, the movies, the radio, and in books. This trial, held during the summer of 1925, resulted in finding Scopes guilty. The law was satisfied. Other southern states had similar laws. This law made a high school student ineligible to university admission because Southern students did not complete coursework in biology. All the while, it's important to remember that at the university level, at, uh, in Southern colleges, evolution was not taught as well. This act was repealed decades later in 1967. The Harlem Renaissance was a high point of black fiction and poetry, the writing of plays, painting and fashion trends, and jazz music in Harlem, a New York City urban neighborhood. This cultural movement began in 1919 and ended by the mid-1930s. With the end to prohibition and the economic turndown with the Great Depression, black Americans struggled to adapt to the challenges of the times. This cultural movement encouraged self-discovery, artistic achievement, and the development of a truly unique black community in a segregated America. And during Prohibition, Harlem and its many jazz music speakeasies were common destinations for middle class and elite New Yorkers. Activities such as those found in Harlem symbolized a modern America. 
Most of the blacks engaged in this cultural renaissance came north to New York City after World War I in search of jobs and opportunities. They traveled from the American South. Most were slave descendants. They arrived before and after World War I. For immigrant blacks from the Caribbean, men and women flocked to New York City in hopes of a better life. Harlem became a popular black destination. The purpose of the Harlem Renaissance was to educate other blacks regarding their rich cultural heritage. All the while, politically, Americans served to challenge racial stereotypes, and this movement tried to do just that. For whites willing to cross the color line, it created a unique interracial experience. The music rates were many. In the American memory, Duke Ellington looms large. Often black musicians played to mixed race audiences. Unlike at other Harlem destinations, at the famous Cotton Club, Duke Ellington played to an audience that was exclusively white. A New Yorker or traveler would see a show at the Apollo Theater. Ella Fitzgerald, a talented singer, made her first appearance at the Apollo at age 17. Progressive reformers saw artistic forms that encouraged the participation of both blacks and whites, such as later with blues-infused rock music, as a means that would foster social change and pluralism of society. An American didn't need to be black or Asian to be unhappy in this society. Among white intellectuals and writers after World War I, artists and others pointed out to a reading public that in America there were limits. That because of the social structure and racial segregation, Americans could never reach their full potential as individuals and that most should accept their life as it is. American print reinforced ideas of conformity, purchasing of material goods, and upholding traditional prejudices against the poor and people of color. F. Scott Fitzgerald, E. E. Cummings, and Ernest Hemingway were writers known as the Lost Generation. They were disillusioned with American society and its principles after World War I. They questioned the meaning of war. They questioned class and racial biases. They lived in Paris writing plays, books, and poems about American life. They drank cheap wine during the U.S. Prohibition while living in France in cheap rooms and eating cheap street fair grub to survive. The literary trend this generation brought to be is called modernism. F. Scott Fitzgerald was brought up Roman Catholic. While he was not a good student, he possessed the intellect that would take him far. Eventually, he ended up at Princeton University, graduating at four years by 1917. As a young novelist, Fitzgerald, like his contemporaries, found it difficult to be financially self-supportive until the 1920s. For F. Scott Fitzgerald, most consider his first novel, This Side of Paradise, as his best. The Great Gatsby was published in 1925. It did not receive the expected acclaim or sell as well. Of this generation of writers, this decade reflected the years writing in France, as mentioned, drinking cheap wine, and the friendships made along the way with like-minded Americans in Paris who were disillusioned with their culture back home. Once an established novelist, like his contemporaries, Fitzgerald wrote articles, human interest sagas, such as the ones he contributed to the Saturday Evening Post magazine. 
Ernest Hemingway and John Steinbeck stand out in this literary genre as well. In their novels, life plays out with many twists and turns. For these fictional characters, like in real life, their existence is filled with uncertainty, poverty, determination, and courage. The following five books are memorable to me. Perhaps you will find time in your life to read them. Ernest Hemingway, The Sun Also Rises. Also, Old Man and the Sea. The following three are by John Steinbeck. The Grapes of Wrath, Cannery Row, and the most entertaining of all, Tortilla Flats.